thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you also for hopefully some of you joining us all over the world on the stream. We're live streaming this event from downtown Old Town in Stockholm. Yay. On the sea. Yeah, this is a little bit of a dream come true for me. Uh, me and Mikael, I remember us talking about this idea that we had over a year ago. What if we could get the best that people that we could find, the most brilliant minds we could find, and bring one of the most inspiring topics to them? I remember us talking about that because we're actually in Stockholm in November, which is traditionally the month of announcements, or October, I should say, for um, the Nobel Prize. And it's actually awarded not even a kilometer away from here in downtown Stockholm in the City Hall. This is by no means a Nobel Prize, but, the big but, if there was one, I wouldn't hesitate to consider some of the people that we have on this stage, which is a great honor and an exciting evening for me, and hopefully something that's going to excite us all and inspire us about the future, because that is the topic for tonight, the future of work, and having a conversation among noble minds about that. And the way we want to do this is to make sure that this gradually becomes a more participatory experience for all of us in here as we move forward through this evening. So don't think for a second that you're just going to sit there for a couple of hours listening like a cinema. No, this may actually involve you guys. So by that, I just want to turn over to Mikael Goethe, who's helping us uh, to arrange this evening. And this is kind of a continuation of the two days, right? Yes, we have. This, we are on a boat actually, uh, and we've been rocking this boat for two days. We've had the Agile People uh, yearly conference, and the theme this year has been the future of work. And uh, this is kind of a post conference event that we open up. So um, we get. Uh, we really have to see all of you here. And also, we are doing this in collaboration with more networks. We thought about inviting more people, but to scale it, we need to invite. Uh, more networks instead. So uh, we have the Agile people, but we also have the Engineering Leadership uh, Stockholm team or community, and we also have the Food Cafe uh, community. So please come up here on stage and join us so we can hear a little bit more about what type of community you have. Hello. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about our community because I think most of you are probably familiar with it already. Uh, but two shout outs. Uh, first of all, to Mikke for bringing this lineup here. This is, uh, I'm not going to swear, but it's amazing. Uh, so thank you for that. And also to one of our co organizers for sponsoring tonight. So, Dreams, give it up for Didde at the very back. Thank you so much, Didde. Hey, I'm, I'm Ellie, I'm the Foo, um, the Foo Cafe Stockholm Community Manager. And uh, Foo Cafe is sort of, it's a concept, it's a company that tries to make it easier for small user groups to meet up regularly. So um, we really value the sharing of knowledge, particularly within the tech industry. And uh, we find that in user groups, too often, all of the responsibility is left up to one leader to try and find a venue and a sponsor and food and drinks. Um, and so we kind of handle that for them for free. So we give the venue and pizza and beer um, and we connect them to a larger tech network. Um, and we hope that by doing that, these user groups are going to meet up more regularly. They're going to learn more from each other and eventually they're going to create more cool cool stuff together. Um, so we do that for free for them. And then we connect with long-term partners of Food Cafe, um, the kind of sponsors that don't just like pounder geeks with the recruitment and advertising, um, but they really do want to help fund um, the sharing of knowledge. Um, and they make what we do possible. So we run events here in Stockholm um, at Go2Tia. To um, and we just want to support you guys because we think you're sharing knowledge, which is at the same values as us. Um, and so we're giving out free drinks. If you haven't already got one, um, come find us later. We have plenty of spare cards. Um, but yeah, we think what you're doing is epic, so keep doing it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming here. 
So this is about sharing, it's about meeting, and then it's about community. So with that, we want to turn the attention to the stage and our participants up here. So um, I just want to mention that we have a hashtag Agile people if you want to uh, tweet or interact somehow, especially if you're on the live stream. So um, my guests, I would like you to can I make a short introduction of yourselves. Let's start with you, Susan. Yeah. Thanks, Matthias. Thanks. You don't want to <laughs> start? Thanks, Miguel. I don't mind starting. Uh, my name is Susan Basterfield. I um, am from Inspiral in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and it's a privilege to be in Stockholm uh, once again um, amongst friends. And I feel it's such a privilege to see so many faces that I recognize and to be on the stage with noble minds who are also friends and people I love and that's a real privilege. And uh, tonight's going to be fun. Uh, I think that we're going to dive into some deep stuff, but we'll keep it light at the same time. I'm just honored to be here. Maybe we can start with James. OK, well, um, my name's James Priest. Uh, I've had the pleasure and privilege of speaking at Agile People Conference yesterday on the topic of organizational agility at scale uh, and also the future of work and organizations. Um, so I spend most of my time right now sharing about a topic I'm very passionate about. Uh, it's a kind of practical guide for practices that organizations can use, and it's called Sociocracy 3.0. I shall refer to it as S3 throughout this evening. It's less syllables and more simple. Um, but beneath that, I'm just immensely... Why I'm here is that I'm immensely passionate about this topic, not so much of organizations per se, but around the potentiality of us as human beings to have meaningful, healthy, collaborative relationships. I anticipate our potential is extraordinary, and I suspect what we have achieved till now is just a small portion of what's possible. Yeah, so um, I'm here in service of that this evening and over the last days, and I imagine probably for the foreseeable future to come. My name is Doug Kirkpatrick. Um, I have uh, been privileged to spend the last 28, 29 years um, working in and with a completely self-managed enterprise with no human bosses, the only boss being the mission statement of the enterprise. And uh, today I, I work with a new focus strategic group and I spend about half my time traveling all over, uh, evangelizing about the future of work, speaking and writing, um, and I spend the rest of my time working with companies and leaders um, to help them smash hierarchies and create self-managed ecosystems that allow people to thrive and do their best work. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Bonita Roy. Um, when you meet me, you can call me Bonnie. Uh, I come from uh, Northwest Connecticut. I live on a horse farm. Um, I have a um, nonprofit 501c3 educational institution, institution uh, which focuses on adult learning. And over the years, I've realized that people like yourself have so much capacity. We have so much untapped capacity. And there's like a gap between where we are and really we're so close to the future we want to see, we can almost taste it, right? So when you're with people, you can get this sense that like, yeah, yeah, we're, you're exchanging. Can, you can almost taste it. So I want to close that gap. I think we have uh, window of opportunity that's really opening up now and uh, so um, my business organization is an initiative of my educational institution and that business organization is called App Associates uh, where I, I, I talk about some of this stuff in a business context and I'm very very happy to be here. Take the mic, maybe. It's the technician on the phone. Yeah, oh, now it is. Oh, yay. Okay. Hello, everyone. 
My name's Joshua Vile, and I'm an entrepreneur, an educator, and a programmer, a passionate technologist. And for the last seven or eight years, I've been uh, helping grow an entrepreneurial network called Inspiral, uh, mostly based in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but people all around the world. And a longtime fan of the thinking of all the people on this stage, and it's just an absolute delight and joy to be able to dive into ideas that I'm so excited about. Uh, and I'd say that for me, I'm very excited by how we work and how we do things, but also passionate about what we work on. Because I didn't think doing the wrong thing really well is worse than doing nothing at all. So I'm very passionate about how can we do the right thing really well when it comes to working together. Thanks, everybody. Um, just a few technical notes. Um, there is a, a board here to the uh, right of me, to the left of you, for questions that might pop up for you during, during the evening. You'll also notice that there are a couple of spare chairs on the stage that we expect to be filled by several of you during the course of the night, so steal yourself up and prepare for that. I'm going to do something a little bit risky maybe for a live stream straight off and just invite everybody in the room here and also those that are watching via the live stream to just take a moment and reflect and, and write down, if you, if you can, the answer to this question, and that's What's living in you right now? What's most alive in you right now? I'm not going to ask you to share it, but it'd be lovely if you could reflect on that for one minute. I'm going to keep my promise to the audience that I'm not going to ask you to share, but I certainly am going to ask these noble minds to share. What's alive for you? What's living in you right now? Um, so it was a really wonderful invitation. And um, so something came up for me that, that I hadn't actually thought in this, this way before. So I pay attention. And that is, um, I'm feeling a sense of uh, service, being of service, being in service, but in a different way. Uh, it, what came up was this sense of like, I don't, it's not up to me to decide how I'm in service. It's up to me to participate with like James and Doug and you, and how have you all shape the service that I'm providing. So it was a kind of a interesting, uh, reenactment of of that notion for me that that I think is shaped by our what we've experienced and the way we've shared over the last couple of days. So that mm -hmm. that was what came up for me. Thanks. Okay, I think I can follow from that. So one thing that's come up for me in kind of preparation for this evening is this term noble minds and. The, and as I was coming here tonight, racing from one thing to another, I thought, oh wow, but I, I want to be a humble mind. <laughs> you know, I really want to, I, I don't know if you have this experience, but the older I get, the less I realize I know. I guess that's learning something new. Um, I know much less now than I knew 20 years ago, for sure. Um, so this is one thing that was around for me, and, and a kind of peace with that. I think humility was a, a journey I had to go on, and I, I suspect that we need to discover arrogance before we can truly embrace humility, actually. So um, that topic's around, and the other thing that was around is a very practical need I have, and I'm going to take care of it right now because I rushed in and I didn't have a chance to get water. And I was sitting with this sense of thirst, and I thought, wow, this physical need I have for water right now is so strong that I can barely focus on anything else. 
And why am I not getting up to get water? And I thought, well, because the, the rules are, we're on stage, I don't want to walk in front of these people. <laughs> yeah, because the rules are that we're live streaming and I should sit here like a noble mind in my <laughs> leather armchair, you know, and, and do what's expected of me. And I thought, but I can't do what's expected of me. I'm going to die of thirst in a minute. So could you excuse me a moment? You're making me thirsty. And, and the other thing that came, once I acknowledged that, I thought, wow, that's very interesting. You know, in the context of work and, and being with people, it's like how important our basic needs are as human beings. And when they're not taken care of, how distracting that is and how it impedes capacity to do what's expected. Yeah? So it's, it's a kind of paradox because I'm doing what's expected and not taking care of basic needs and then I can't do what's expected. So this was very interesting for me for a moment. And the one other thing that came having acknowledged it, like all experiences when they're acknowledged, you know, they kind of move on and something else happens, was very much connected to what you said, this sense of openness and, and like not knowing what this is about, not knowing what I'm here for other than just to acknowledge this space and be in surrender to whatever emerges. So this was my experience in those moments. So I think uh, about the need of uh, all of us as human beings to manage the important polarities in our lives. And I think one of the most important ones is the objective versus the subjective. So the objective is the domain of facts and data and equations and knowledge and the subjective is the domain of intuition and emotion and understanding and depth. And it's our job to, to manage the transcendence between the two domains and the way we do that is, is through our bodies. And we have to be able to translate the objective into the subjective and, and back out into the world and it's really the job of each and every one of us as human beings and they're they're completely separate. It's why we don't talk about poetic engineering or, or scientific love. They're just two different things, and we have to be able to manage between them. <laughs> you, you were just going to say scientific love. I have. <laughs> okay, is this mic on now? No. Back to this one. The green light's on and everything. All right. Uh, I think, so what's alive for me? It changes with it with something that everyone says, and I was initially thinking about, you know, the, the lovely saying of like, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. That kind of vibe of what needs to change in our systems, in terms of our global way of being, in terms of our legal structures, in terms of our company policies. What needs to change in all of our systems that are external to us and external to me, for us to have different experiences and different outcomes because I think many people would like to have different experiences and different outcomes. So I started to think about that, and uh, one of the, the things that I love when James was speaking was that just the, there would have been a time when, like, an event called Noble Minds and being called a Noble Mind and put on stage would have made me feel deeply uncomfortable. And I think there's lots of times where this, my experience of the world, is very, it's just so self-focused. It's just so me, this is how I feel and how I think. And then it's the, the, ability, the invitation to transcend that and it just doesn't matter. And it's just this whole sense of thinking about outside world, thinking about that and losing the sense of self in it is I think something that's very much alive for me. The idea of how can we be individuals and be active and be in service and participate, but how can we lose our sense of self in that? And how can we actually explore what selfless feels like as a, as a verb rather than as an aspiration? So that's something that's, that's sparking up from this conversation for me. Yeah, so that really inspires me um, in, a, in a big way. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as humans, we have a certain way that we organize our perceptions of the world and we make mental models. And one of the things we do is we deanimate the objective world. And uh, this is, uh, um, I think, something that is um, going to change and it's on the horizon. So what do I mean about that? We, we, we uh, ran into this problem in terms of ecological management, right? So how can I manage the ecology? 
And you see, I, it's a systems type of thinking where I've deanimated the system or the ecology that I'm in. You see this problem in management science all the time, that managers think they can stand outside of their team and manage it. So within the team, they are living active actors, but I treat them as a system, I deanimate them. So uh, one of the things that's very profound practice is to see that that is merely a choice your mind and your mental models making. So when you said you get up to drink the water, the water was actually, water's very animating. So I saw this, uh, this uh, uh, Planet Earth video once and it talked about when the water comes into the Serengeti, the mass migrations of all the herds. And the language was the herds were moving to the water but what I saw was the water had the power to animate all these animals to it, right? And so coffee, coffee moves millions of people, especially in Switzerland, every morning. And you start to see that the world, that, that this is actually just a mental model, what we consider to be subject, what we consider to be actor, and what we, we deanimate. And I think this is some, I think what you're touching on, that there's a way in which we get re-enchanted with the world when we stretch and choose a, and open ourselves to a different expression, a different participation. So. Mm -hmm. I just want to celebrate the use of the word anything working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, one of the microphones is going. I want to celebrate the use of the word re-enchantment. And I think so much when I think about the future of work and what excites me is people being re-enchanted and passionate like you were when you were a child about going to work and about doing things with other people and that, that opportunity to be re-enchanted in groups and to, that, that, that's just deeply exciting for me. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that that makes me think about w what, what do we think is preventing us from fully showing up, fully showing up in our lives and, and fully showing up in work to be open and receptive and having the posture of a child that's, you know, I don't know, on, the, on their first Christmas morning. I think it has something to do with biology. Um, Ian Robertson, um, wrote a book, The Winter Effect, How Power Affects the Brain. And so we learned that uh, when people exercise command authority in the workplace or elsewhere, they, they get a shot of dopamine in the brain. People become literally addicted to power. So um, that's why we have democratic institutions in the world. It, it's a pattern of checks and balances so we can try to arrest some of these negative tendencies that, that hold us back. As, as human agents and human actors in, in the workplace and elsewhere. So I think that has something to do with it. Okay, I'd like to jump in on that as well, just to take another angle. So I spent 10 years working with, the term that's given officially is at-risk young people, so children and young people. And there was two kind of broad categories of kids that I worked with. There were the kids who were super vulnerable. Like their, their life choice or their kind of defense mechanism was to remain vulnerable. Because in, in many of those cases, they, they had experienced abuses of power. And for them to remain meek and small was to reduce the potential to suffer in the way that they had before. So these were the kids that were school phobic. I said they were the smart kids. I mean, I think everyone should be a bit school phobic. You know, I, I really have concerns about the institutionalization of human beings and certain aspects of socialization. But that's probably a topic we can come back to later. But the other side was the kids who had taken the opposite choice. You know, and that, that was basically to disown vulnerability. You know, they had suffered so much in their lives. You know, there's this story of the bully that becomes the bullied. Yeah? They suffered so much in their lives that they made a decision to not be vulnerable again. And what they did, if you look at vulnerability as something to be owned or something to be pushed away, they put that vulnerability onto others by bullying those others, by putting those others down, by, by basically making everybody else carry that vulnerability for them. So there was kind of a, a like sacred contract between the vulnerable kids and the, the kids who identify with power. 
So 10 years was really like a, 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 a thoroughly insightful journey for me to understand something about power and vulnerability. You know, this is a polarity that's relevant for every one of us because we're all born vulnerable and we will all die for sure and we are vulnerable to death at any moment. And all of our strategies are basically in the endeavor to sustain our existence for as long and as well as possible. Yeah? S s sorry to put it so bluntly, but I mean, that's the bottom line. This is the nature of our predicament. And what I observed working with these kids was that the kids who identified with vulnerability, they could really see the value in having more power. They just had a very good reason not to own it. <laughs> Yeah? I see it would be good for me to step up, James. I see it would be good for me to speak up, but I just, I'm really, really scared to do it. But the kids who disown vulnerability, yeah, for them to understand the, the, the value of being open to be impacted again, that was a whole other story. You know, because for them, for them to even like, consider that possibility was to open themselves up to that risk of harm. It was, that was the trajectory that would take them back into their trauma and back into their wound, you see. And so we have a very interesting social system, you know, because uh, like, especially in, in the, corporate, the corporate sector, I mean, some say the corporate entity is like a psychopathic entity, you know, it's got all the rights of a human being and it doesn't care, it doesn't give a shit. I mean, to put it bluntly, yeah? And these kids, on the surface at least, they didn't care. Deep down, they cared a lot. Yeah, but on the surface, they didn't care either. And, you know, in the extremes, we see people who completely disassociate from vulnerability, from empathy. Yeah? So this is like at the extreme periphery of this kind of circumstance. And they grow up to enter into the world, and the ones that are able to kind of tick the boxes in their academic journey and kind of make their way to the top, well, they, they naturally filter up and up through the system. So we end up with a kind of the cream of the, of the top, the people who cared least, you know, so they were able to make those hard decisions yeah, in order for that organization, that, that careless entity to sustain itself and to thrive. And it feeds on anyone who has more vulnerability than it. You know, these kids fed on anybody who was more vulnerable than them, and they just stayed away from anything that looked bigger than them. So there's this very natural kind of distillation and hierarchy. And, and I, I think it's really important for us, before we get into kind of labeling whether these things are good or bad, yeah, is to understand some of the, the deeper uh, the stories that we can all connect to here and the, the relationship of power to vulnerability. We talk about empowerment, one final point here. What's your definition of empowerment? Yeah. People talk about empowering people. You can't empower people. No. What you can do is you can support people to have an experience of an environment where they feel safe enough to dare to use their power in service of vulnerability in creative ways. For me, this is empowerment, power in service of vulnerability. And if I think about human collaboration, in essence, all human collaboration is in service of human needs. But a lot of organizations today, they're in service of a few human beings' needs and screw everybody else. And I wonder, in the future, is it possible that we can shift that center of balance to a, a far greater number of organizations that are, are, are really focused to the essence of why they exist, and that is to create value for us. You know, it's like us creating value for ourselves, us nourishing our own capacity to thrive, you know, to, to co-create and to grow. I think bouncing off that for me that a lot of what attracted me to the world of self-management in the beginning was I'd had experiences of having power over other people in the employment sort of place and the responsibility of having power over other people and it kind of sucks. Like it's, it, it's, it's, it didn't feel good and it was a hard way to work. And the whole idea of having power with people is a completely different game. And it's an amazing experience to have power to change your world and to have colleagues who have the power to change their worlds and to negotiate consent and how we act together and how we work together is so very different from the burden of responsibility when my power affects other people and they don't have a voice in that or their power affects me and I don't have a voice in that. And that, that possibility attracted me very much to this world and it's why I continue to pursue it so much. Yeah, so I had one response and now it's shifted and moved on. So I just go to what's coming up for me now and that is uh, 
Um, yeah, so I think one of the reasons why we don't, we as this community itself, talking about people like ourselves now, don't show up, is because there's a part of us that knows we're complicit. We're complicit with conventional hierarchy, we're complicit with uh, status quo, economic policy, and consumerism. So um, this is something that if we're really honest with ourselves, is true. And um, the philosopher Roy Bashkar, uh, who died recently, uh, once said, he said the, uh, um, the modern society is built on the back of slaves. And when I first heard that, I thought of, oh, that's not much different than the pyramids. And, you know, I used to, when I was a kid, I was like, why did all those people, you know, hundreds and thousands of them, like, carry rocks? Like, wouldn't it be just easier to, like, bludgeon the guys to death? You know, I just, like, couldn't understand why this whole effort and energy went to, to the privilege of the few. And when Roy Bashkar said that, I thought about the pyramids. And then the next thing I thought of was, yeah, all those blue-collar workers, all those slaves. And then I was on an airplane coming back from the symposium where he had said that, and then it hit me. Those aren't the slaves. The well-paid managers and the educators and the people that <coughs> buy in. And, and I just realized that, that we were all complicit. We were slaves. So you see how that, 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 that movement went for me, from you know, projecting in the past to, oh yeah, I can see these poor laborers, they're obviously slaves, they don't get paid a lot, they do a lot of the work. But what he was saying is that we, capitalism in our world is built on really the backs of this class of people because we are really quite the productive information class now. And I was like, oh my God, now I understood why those, Real slaves in, in Egypt walked every day to produce the pyramids. So I think what prevents us from showing up is we have to figure out this, this game we're playing with ourselves in terms of knowing that we're complicit. And only then, only till we reconcile then, we won't be, you know, right now most people have one foot in one place and one foot in another. So that, that's, that's what comes up for me. Mm -hmm. Just to riff on the empowerment question, uh, I would um, actually argue that employee empowerment is an oxymoron. Um, when you think about empowerment programs that have been around for the last quarter century, um, they all talk about um, people with power lending their power to subordinates who have less power. And the problem with that scenario is that what you loan can be repossessed at any time. So employees really don't have power. Um, it can be yanked away. Uh, you either have it or you don't. And that's a, a big part of why I'm a believer in self-managed organizations at their core, where people have all the power they need from the first day they start work to acquire resources build relationships and to do their best work in collaboration with others. Yeah. Um, oh, can I just say one thing? Sure, please. I knew I got it wrong. He said it was built on the cre creativity of the slaves. Mm -hmm. That's, that was why it was so. The creativity of the slaves that were continuously creative in the way we adapt to these things. So thank you because I just mm. realized that that's... <laughs> what he said, which has got more juice. I was impressed with how you were extracting that distant memory from your uh, noble mind, <laughs> Bonnie. <laughs> wakey, <impressive>, wakey! <laughs> yeah, I do that and you'll be waiting half an hour because it's, it's like chasing a slippery ball up a pole, up a tube. Um, so uh, th what th I want to... I want to posit it's a theory, yeah? I don't know if this is actually true, but I, from my point of view, I suspect that it is. So I'll put it out there and see what you think. But um, I worked a lot in the past. I trained as an integrative counselor, and I worked around this theme of psychology of selves. And it basically was built around the notion that the psyche is multiple. 
I don't know if you've ever noticed, like if you're with, with your beloved, it's like you behave in a very different way to when you go for the job interview. Well, I mean, it depends on the job interview, right? But, but generally speaking, it's like a different part of you shows up in, in one context to another context. Have you noticed that? Yeah, okay. I mean, right now I'm inviting your mind, no? I'm inviting you to reflect. But earlier we invited, like, just to be aware of what's alive in you and maybe something else happens. And you'll go out and have coffee later and maybe you put on your face to meet somebody. And, and yeah, so we're kind of constantly shifting energy. And um, if we come back to, like, one fundamental polarity, the one I mentioned around power and vulnerability, I, and this idea of complici complicity with the, the status quo, it's like, if I look internally at my own psyche, what, something I discovered, I did a lot of therapy and personal work, and I became aware of the fact that I was dominated in my system by a very narrow set of beliefs, and it was a very strong hierarchy. And there were very good reasons for those rules, because they were based on my past experiences and what got me kind of acceptance, what generated value for me in my life. And, and what was kind of shocking for me as I became an adult was to realize that there were people in the world who were completely different to my familiar context, like family, culture, and so on. And I, and I rapidly began to discover that my habitual patterns and strategies weren't really working anymore. And, and, and so I would try and find people who were like me, you know, and I could feel safe with, and then I'd fall in love with somebody who was completely opposite. And for a while, it would be beautiful, and then I'd find myself looking in the mirror of something that I felt so uncomfortable around. And... Um, the work I did was basically to kind of reintegrate these different aspects of myself and, and to do it. The prerequisite was that I made vulnerability conscious. You know, that I went behind these strategies to find out what am I afraid of? What is it that I'm fearful of that like, keeps me identified with these certain behaviors and prevents me from being able to access other aspects of myself, opposite aspects of myself that bring value to. Um, and when I came across sociocracy, this was back in 2000, and I was quite deep into this work, and I, and I looked at sociocracy and I realized, well, it's inviting people through c intention to create a space where a diversity of voices could be heard. You know, like this tension of opposites could be externalized in the space. And, and before we come down one way or the other in a kind of binary, dual way of dealing with the world, it's like instead to hold that tension, and, and what happens is something emerges it's like a creative space in which something emerges where choice becomes realization instead of something that we make or do. You know? It's kind of like a, a transition from a tri uh, binary consciousness or a dual consciousness to triune consciousness. And this got me thinking about power because I was looking at organizations. I thought, wow, a lot of organizations, they're just like my, my intrapsychic universe has been. You know? It's like this dominant rule system that commands everything. It's if, if I remain identified with that, will probably lead to my early demise or kind of lots of miserable circumstances. And I thought it's exactly the same thing. It's fractal, it's externalized. And I zoomed out more and I looked at the world at large and I thought, my goodness, it's the same thing. We're living in this dualistic construct. You know? And there's this kind of dominant system, like power concentrated to a few ideas and a few kind of constraints. And, and over time, it self-perpetuates and builds and everything else gets kind of pushed down. And there's lots of reasons not to be like this and not to be like that because it's just so vulnerable, it's just so frightening. And I saw Occupy, I saw people angry, I saw people polarized, you know? And, and we talk about the 0.01% and, and people are so angry about it. And I, and I realized, oh, we're just energizing that. Because we're basically saying, you're more powerful than me. And whether I kind of comply with you or I rage against you, it's the same thing. I still project power onto you somehow. Is this making sense to you? It's like we project power onto something and in doing so, we give it power. So I thought, well, what, what should we do instead? And then I looked at what I'd done instead. What, what I did instead was through a, a very challenging and, and painful and kind of spiral journey of discovery and resistance and denial and discovery and resistance and denial and... You know, it's, like the, the, it's a very painful thing sometimes to grow, you know, because we, we have to be vulnerable somehow. And I, and I realized that we are complicit in like, uh, the maintenance of this system, and we're not going to change it through banging against it. You can't change it by going against it. 
because it just energizes it more. So what is it we need to do? Well, what is it you need to do? What is it I need to do? What is it we need to do? Is like take the power back, yeah? But not take it back to use it to bash the other people over the head with, because then we just become a, the, the part of the, the same problem, yeah? But I mean take the power back consciously in service of vulnerability for ourselves so that we can live a life with greater integrity, with greater self-compassion and greater compassion for others. And in doing that, one person at a time, you can't do it en masse. You know, it's a personal choice and it's a personal journey, but in one person at a time doing this, it's kind of like the matrix, you know, it's like just pulling the plug out and saying, I'm not going to feed that system anymore. And for every person that does it, that system is a little less powerful. Yeah, and the system seeks to keep people plugged in, and it gives many reasons, many incentives, you know, and if you're not going to bite the hook and swallow the incentives, then it gives you many threats instead. Yeah? It's a self-perpetuating system, but it's just a reflection. It's just a reflection of our own inner psyche. It's the, exter the internal state manifest on the external. And so for me, when I think, how can I change the world and what is it that needs to happen, I, I know what I can do for me more now. But when I look at all of you, I think, wow, I really hope that you realize this too. You know, because I can't do it on my own. This is something we need to do together. And it takes many of us. And this system as it is today would cease to be in this moment if the majority of people made a different choice. There is n no group of people, no military force on planet Earth today that is as powerful as the majority of people on planet Earth who in some way right now project their power out onto some external entity. Because if everybody today said, no more, now we do it differently, it would change in an instant. Yeah. To me, I think just bouncing off the changing minds and the, the doing it one person at a time, it's like an individual can make changes and that's cool, but I think when you get small groups of people like any kind of company, you can create an ecosystem where we can all change our minds in a group together and changing the whole world system, that's a you know, big ask, but changing a single company and let's, say, let's just do stuff differently, let's just have a different social contract with each other is entirely possible. And I've seen so many groups of people which just try and opt in and create a different kind of world together in one go. And that's, that's not hard, that's not scary, and there's actually lots of upsides for doing it. And I think that it's those organizations and those people sharing their stories with each other, which is why it feels like there's so many people who are stepping into this world of self-management. Because it's not a new world. Companies have been doing this for decades and years, and there's lots of examples in history you can draw from. But what I'm seeing now is that more and more people are actually drawing on those examples and sharing their learnings with each other. And it feels like there are these energies and these ideas just uh, cropping up, which it feels like there's a, you know, a renaissance of sort of self-management and of decentralized organizing and, mm -hmm. and that sort of work. It makes me feel like maybe we're getting, maybe sort of getting to figuring out what the answer to what Ezra Pound was pondering on last century when he talked about wondering why we are so good at organizing to face threat, but we're not particularly good at organizing for emergent potential. Can we think about maybe what that could look like in an organization? I think it has a lot to do with language. Um, to, to achieve a, a desired uh, superior future state uh, from wh where we are today is going to take a shift in our, our consciousness and in our language. And it's the job of all of us uh, as leaders and, and colleagues to uh, use words that you know, we may be hard pressed to define on the spot. You know, mindfulness, consciousness, transcendence, um, polarity. All these terms um, are, are going to be crucial. And I think it's the job uh, of us to use these kinds of words to and oscillate back and forth between the current state and the desired future state through the use of transcendent language in order to help people find meaning and purpose. Uh, because that's the only way I think we're going to be able to find the power to get us from, from point A to point B. Um, yeah, so what I'm thinking of is something that I learned that may be helpful. And that is um, 
Um, so previously I talked about this gap. That it seems so close you can almost taste it. But I think as uh, exemplars or trainers or teachers, we tend to discount the little micro steps that people make. And we, we, we want the whole, the whole thing to close at once. And so um, um, what I've learned to do, I, I, I said this organization is called Augler Insight Center. And what, what we do there is it's a kind of facilitation. And some of you that were in the workshop uh, this afternoon noticed that someone will say something and it sounds cool, but you, when, if you listen correctly, it actually has a really cool insight. And, and I will say, this is a really big insight, because the person themselves don't know that they've had a really big insight, right? And you can see them using just the way they use language in a different way, or they've switched the polarity or something. And, and in group process, this will come out naturally. But we need to pay attention and ref immediately reflect back. This is a big insight. And people will go, oh, and then you say, no, 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 this is a big insight. And so we can help people because these emerging ways of being are not happening because we talk about it. We talk about it because we actually see it happening. Mm -hmm. And so our, our, the transition is to be able to see as it emerged and reflect back that this is a big step. And you see it happen naturally. It self-organized itself in this team. This group went farther than I would have expected. Or sometimes teams don't struggle so hard, but they don't know. And they don't know that they've broken through a certain thing. So I think if we can ref continue to reflect those, those steps, or, you know, the gap, it will be built on, on that. So mm -hmm. I, th I think that's part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that bounces for me when I hear that quote about being motivated by fear or hope, it's uh, one of our, my friends and colleagues runs one of the uh, action station in New Zealand. And they're, they're like a VAS or change.org, like big citizen mobilization to change policy and, gov and company behavior. And you know, if they send out an email of like, something bad's going to happen and try and stop it, all these people will respond. If they try and send out an email of let's try and make something new and good that we haven't seen before, much less people respond. And that's, that's okay, that's how humans work. One of the things I think that is really important when we're building systems for humans is to acknowledge our innate biological biases in how we work. Like, if you have power over other people, you will get a hit of dopamine, you will get addicted to that. That's just the way things are. If I feel fearful, if I feel existential threat, I'll be very motivated to remove that threat. And that motivation will be higher than if I see something I want and I want to chase that. That's how humans work. That's OK. And instead of saying, I wish the world was different, it's about acknowledging what things are just how they are and how, what are we going to do with that information. And you know, because I might be more motivated if I'm fearful, but I'll also take fewer risks. I'll fall back on things which I'm more likely to, to, that I think will work. And I'll behave in a more constrained way. And that doesn't give you a great outcome when you're trying to invent a new future. So if you're trying to invent a new future from fear, it will be less creative, less innovative, and less likely to happen. But trying to create a new future from hope, trying to create a new future from love, from aspiration, much more creative, much more expansive, and that's how humans work. So learning how we work individually and how we work in collectives, I think, is one of the ways to, to actually cause the change we want to see in the world. Yeah, I think we have to hack our dopamine system. I think <laughs> it's possible. I think the whole system is constrained both by evolution and conditions, but I think it's hackable. I think, I think it's plastic. And so you have people uh, doing neurohacker, neurohacking and uh, doing a lot of these, trying to create feedback loops, because I think our dopamine systems are basically kind of screwed up. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you can actually uh, realize this in meditation. At first, it's very hard. You have to work against your dopamine system, but then there's a phase switch where the things that are actually good for you give you hits of dopamine. And then you start mm -hmm. building these virtual biological cycles. So I don't want to get too hung up on the deeply wired biology, certainly of, a, of our brain is very, but I think this dopamine system is much more uh, uh, susceptible to retraining. Uh -huh. I, yeah. yeah, so. 
So what, what I was reflecting on as you shared this is the idea, it's like I, I get a dopamine hit now for hacking my dopamine system. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I still, get, I still get the hit, but it's a conscious hit now instead of an unconscious one, right? Cool. I'm going to try this. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite amazing um, what we're learning about human biology. Um, if you get a chance, I, I recommend Paul Zak's The Moral Molecule <laughs> and the importance of oxytocin in the body. And, and uh, the benefits of a hug with another human being last a good solid 20 minutes. So I encourage everyone to hug someone today. <laughs> I'd like to shift text just slightly here, and um, I'd love for the noble minds to answer a question that sits <laughs> with me constantly. Is the organization actually thi a thing, or is it merely a construct of our mind? Here we go. And in, th in that context or not, is it possible for an organization to transform or the organizations that we're imagining for the future, do they, can they only be manifest as emergent entities? So uh, I'd say that an organization is a thing as much as our laws are a thing. So if you think about the imaginings of humankind, Money, money is just imagined. Like it really just, there's nothing real in money physically. There's no molecules which make money happen. There's no laws of gravity or physics which make money a thing. It's just we all imagine it together quite strongly. And that if you just start to say I, I, money's not a thing and, imag and you don't buy into that imagination, life becomes a lot more difficult for you. Uh, and, but you know, even more than money, legal structures are more of an, they're still just imagined. There's nothing in physical reality about laws. But if you just stop paying your taxes or if you start killing people, then things will happen to you because of other humans' belief in those things. And so while it's not a thing, it still makes sense to reason about it as a thing sometimes. And I think that the idea of organizations is that, yes, there's, that there's nothing there as an organization, but uh, the imaginings are weaker than money and laws, but, and so you can reimagine them more easily. They are a bit more plastic, they're less, less um, brittle. And that, but for the people inside of them, as they imagine them longer and longer, they become habitual. So I think of organizations more as collective habits, just like money is a collective habit, and that you can reset those habits together, but it takes a lot of consciousness and effort. Because if you've ever tried to change in a habit you're addicted to, it's not easy, it's not trivial. <coughs> and you can learn about habits and do it more easier, or do it easier, then that's great. And, but if you have a group of people who understand habits and habitual thinking, you can make organizations much more agile. And you can say, oh, the thing we're imagining together, let's change it quickly and easily with a lot of skill and craft. Mm -hmm. I don't think organizations are real. They're just concepts. Teams are just concepts. Companies are just concepts. Human beings are real. Human beings are the ultimate reality. Only human beings can act. Only human beings can think. Only human beings can make decisions. So I'm not sure what the concept of organizations are, is going to look like 100 years from now. Who knows? Um, when you look at the uh, technologies that are converging right now, uh, between blockchain and nanotechnology and virtual reality and artificial intelligence and genetic engineering and all the rest, who knows? I mean, we, we may not have organizations 100 years from now. Uh, we may all just be transacting with each other in, in some kind of a blockchain, blockchainification of employment, who knows? So um, I, I think we need to embrace the unpredictability of the future and adapt to it uh, as it goes forward, just like human beings have throughout history. What about my second question? Ken, do you believe that organizations, in conceptual organizations as they exist today, can transform into something that is fully potentiated, or do they need to start from scratch? I think the concept can uh, improve. Certainly, um, because as it uh, is constructed today, uh, it doesn't fully validate 
uh, human beings or, or their voices. And so that's why I embrace uh, and encourage self-management because it's all about protecting the voices of individual human beings in the environment. So if organizations as concepts can uh, evolve to respect the uh, individual, then um, I think we're in a better place. I'm still thinking about this. <laughs> um, I, I agree with the idea of organizations as a construct. Um, but why I'm a little bit derailed from the, the topic, I was coming back to something you said, Bonnie, I think in your presentation yesterday, or maybe on the panel. It was something around um, you know, like reframing how we see work and asking the question instead, what works? And for me, that, that really stayed with me. I intend to, to quote Bonnie on this for the rest of my life, because I think it's a really valuable Attribution, refresh. James. Sorry? Attribution. Attribution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to attribute Bonnie for the rest of my life for this, this phrase because I think it really gets to the... It's, I'm going to come back to the question, but I th when I ask what works, and I'm honest about that, and when we have a conversation about it together, what works, and probably helpful to be clear why we're doing something so that we know if it's working or not, you know, we've got something to con compare it to, then, then we naturally start to evolve whatever we do. Yeah, because the whole thing becomes kind of improvement orientated. So I, I see that fundamental for transformation of organizations today is to like, or a, a prerequisite is to be asking this question. Mm -hmm. And not only to be able to ask the question, but to have the, the capacity and the resources to be able to act. Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think anyone in an organization can look and ask the question, what works? And they're going to get a lot of immediate feedback just from looking around at, at what's working and what isn't. Yeah. Um, so the, the habitual strategies aside and the, the, the reasons why people stay entrenched in their roles and hold on to power or project power and so on aside, but certainly it, this prerequisite of openness to improve on the basis of our kind of empirical <laughs> inquiry, you know? in terms of what's actually working and what's not. Well, again, just a caveat here, empirical. I mean, like, it's empirical to recognize people saying, hey, this really hurts and I don't like it. <laughs> you know, like, we, can, we can include that in the realm of what's empirical kind of feedback. So I, I was in the workshop today and had the privilege hanging out with 40 people for the day. And in the morning we came together and I said, why are you here? Like, write down for yourself two key issues you're facing in organizations today that you would like to leave here with some insight around how to change, yeah? Because it's not working or you see an opportunity and you, you don't know how to leverage it. And you know these people, there was 40 of us, so we, we spent about 17 minutes in total. That's nine and three quarter hours of human time, right? In identifying the top two priorities, grouping them together like each person, clustering them, and then prioritizing a backlog of topics for us to address in the workshop. And instead of just jumping in and going through the whole time frame from beginning to end, after the first five minutes, we stopped and said, what works? Yeah. What's going well? What do you appreciate? And the next question was, and how could you improve? So people shared, in the first pause, a couple of appreciations, a couple of improvement suggestions. Okay, how much more time do you need? They said, oh, I don't know, maybe three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. So we took another three minutes, I think, the second time. We stopped again. What works? Yeah. What goes well? What could you do to improve? Now there were many appreciations. Yeah, and there were many improvement suggestions. And we went through four iterations, 17 minutes in total. And at the end, a new group of 40 people yeah, had identified and prioritized a, a list of topics to address in that day. And uh, what was so interesting, like the kind of, the, they categorized the topics, and I can't remember them all right now, but there were things like collaboration, trust, communication, values. Yeah. And so <laughs> we were able to look at like learning outcomes in relation to these topics after 17 minutes of this experience. You know? And they realized, wow, we've built some trust, we've improved our communication, uh, we've evolved some basic collaboration skills together, yeah, we've kind of lived and expressed certain values. Yeah, it was such an amazing transformation of this group. And the, the, the key piece was just stopping to reflect. 
you know? And asking what works and what doesn't. And if it's not working as the way we would wish, then how can we improve it? And having that inquiry together, tapping collective intelligence, uh, it was a really awesome experience. And so I, 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 I'm not so much in the business of imagining the future organization. I've got no idea, as you were saying, and who knows if, if we even have this. But I can imagine human beings for the rest of the existence of humanity asking the question, what works and what doesn't? And if it's not good enough like this, what can we do to change it? <coughs> so... Um I don't know if it, an organization is a thing or not. I've written quite about, a lot about it. <clears throat> but I think, what's the purpose of the question? And, I, it, and so something I know for sure is that if you think an organization is a thing, then your life is going to be one way at work. And if you think your organization is just patterns of human relating, then you're going to have different choices and different ways of uh, being at work. And so uh, I think we have the choice to use our minds to think of organizations in one way or another. And I think that makes, a, that's the difference that makes the difference. And I'm just gonna give you an example that's kind of tangential, but hopefully it'll make meaning for you. So I listened to this uh, story on NPR about a man who was involved in gangs in LA. He grew up, you know, his brothers were already gang members, his cousins were gang members. He married someone who was the sister of gang members and this was multi-generational. So for him, the gang was a thing, a real thing. And it's upheld by shared stories reproduced over time. And it was an extraordinary uh, episode because what happened to this man is he started to realize that, that it was not a thing. And the first phase is, but if I just left, then my brother will kill, you know, there was so, so many if-then reasons that went on in his head. So that's the systemic thinker, you know, but then if this, then that, and all these things are coupled. And that kept him in for another couple of years because he was afraid if he left, then his wife would be punished and all this thing. And then one day, he just walked away. Just walked away. And he was now reflecting about what a difference that made. And this philosopher, Jean Gebser, says that most of what we think is real are self-made cages. So I don't know if an organization is a thing or not, but I know it makes a big difference if you choose to make it a thing or you choose to see the dynamic interactions between people as they arise moment to moment. I think it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And you have the choice. You get to choose. Bonnie made some incredibly great points there. Um, a dear friend, Peter Kessenbaum, he's 90 years old now, and he wrote a, an amazing book called Freedom and Accountability at Work. And he said everything everything starts with free will. So the kinds of organizations we choose to associate with depends on our free will. Uh, the kinds of organizations we choose to create depends on our free will. Um, everything starts there. Um, I had a friend who ha had a friend in a large tech company in Silicon Valley. He said, well, my friend is just trapped in this horrible, rotten job he can't leave because he's got to stay another year to invest in his pension benefits. And I said, no, no, he doesn't. It's completely his choice. Viktor Frankl taught us, you know, even a prisoner being led to the gallows has a choice in how he reacts to the gallows. 
So everything really is a choice. Everything is free will, and our exercise of free will will determine how fast we close the gap and reach our destination. Mm -hmm. I think. So with that uh, invocation of free will, I'm just curious if there's anybody sitting in our beautiful audience that is holding a question that you'd like to offer to the Noble Minds, and better yet, if anybody from our lovely audience would like to come and join us on stage, come on up. There's two empty chairs, so there's room for two. Here's Kale. Welcome, Kale. Thank you very much. Um, this is real. Yeah. Yeah, so how do I turn this on? It should be on. Keep talking. Keep talking? No. No. <laughs> Does this? Oh, yeah. that, oh. Yes, yeah. that one works. <laughs> okay. um, well, uh, would, would you like to introduce yourself, please, and offer, offer your uh, question to the... Right. Oh. Oh. Start. Right. Uh, I'm Kalle. I'm one of the co-organizers uh, co of uh, Engineering Leaders Stockholm. And basically, my first question is, how do you smash hierarchies in a hostile environment? <coughs> <laughs> that sounds like quite a hostile thing to do. I mean, I think that oh, was yeah. your um, it was your phrase, Doug, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I think like trad traditional hierarchies, a, a lot of the things that we're talking about right now, in some cases, it's been started from scratch. Like in in your case, in your case, it comes with the culture self management. But in like, I would say ninety percent of the audience is in a different situation where a traditional hierarchy is, is a fact of life. Mm -hmm. And much of what we do to change those hierarchies is basically a guerrilla movement. Uh, so, and you know, sometimes you take over Cuba and sometimes you end up like chair in Bolivia, kind of. Uh, so, so that's my question. Like, how, how do we transcend those limitations of tra traditional hierarchies? when we're limited by uh, basically the people in power being able to take that initiative away from us mm -hmm. or at least um, you know have a very serious effect on our personal lives in terms of salaries and stuff that we like to get at the end of the month usually okay you probably want the much yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right so um um, so, um, Peter Kassenbaum wrote a, an extremely influential article in, in uh, 1991, Fast Company magazine, Do You Have the Will to Lead? Um, actually, Polly Labar and Gary Hamill's uh, associate uh, wrote the article interviewing Peter, and you know he explained that it, it requires a, a declaration of intent on the part of the person in power that I want to make this change. And I see this desired future state, this destination, that's where I want to go. Uh, I have the power to acquire the resources to dedicate to this journey. And so that's what we're going to do. And uh, without that, uh, if you're just uh, trying to make a change without uh, the uh, imprimatur of the person who has the power to quash any change, it will not succeed. Yeah, I would thoroughly agree with this. Yeah, and um, it's very valuable in those instances to ask the question how we want to spend our short, precious lifetime you know, in those kinds of circumstances. And I want to come back to like, the metaphor of the, the intrapsychic world. So when I was working with clients around this work of, of uh, basically like building relationship, positive relationship with the hierarchy, the internal power structure, it's like you couldn't go around it. You couldn't go under it. As a kid's story, you know, can't go around it, can't go over it, can't go under it. You just got to go through it. And what that meant was that there was a need to build relationship directly with that center of power. You know, and, and in, 
in the majority of cases, I think these people in positions of power genuinely do believe that them doing what they're doing is what's best for the system. And unless they see a reason or some example of something different, yeah, and or they have a very strong need for something different and it exceeds their capacity to facilitate the change they want to see, then they're going to just dig in and stay there. Yeah? And at the same time, so it brings up the question why? You know, why are you holding a position of power? Why am I holding a position of power? Because if we can go in with that inquiry yeah, and have that conversation and build rapport, like genuine rapport, not like covertly, oh, I've just got to get you out of here, I want to smash you or you know, smash this hierarchy, but genuinely inquiry, hey, what are you taking care of? You know, and what do you do well here? And what's the value that you being in this position brings in our current paradigm? You know, and, and what do you love to do? And, and then getting into this inquiry, okay, what's more difficult for you and what are you you're struggling with? You know, then, then you kind of find the cracks in the, in the hierarchy where it's not working. Where it's, because, of course, hierarchy, you can't handle complexity with hierarchy, not in an effective way. You, know? you can just command and control and, and over time lose effectiveness. So I think that this is, this is one thing that I realized, and it was exactly the same working with clients, you know. It's like we used to have conversations with people's inner selves. It was really awesome. And you'd meet a protector and they'd be like this. You know, the, the client would come in and I'd say, hey, how you doing? And they'd see like, ah, I see, see you're pretty defensive, you know, and the person would move over. And like, this, is, this was the game, the kind of game we played. It's called voice dialogue. It's very cool stuff. I'd be like, wow. I see you looking at me. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Why are you looking at me? Well, because he's come in to do this therapy crap and I'm really concerned, you know? <laughs> what are you concerned about? Well, I'm concerned he's going to go digging around in stuff he shouldn't be digging around in. Right? There's stuff he shouldn't be digging around in? Yeah, damn right. He doesn't know how to handle it. Ah, okay. Could you tell me a bit more about that? I'm not sure yet. I'm just going to check you out for a minute. Okay. It's fine. Take your time. I see that you're taking care of him. Yeah, that's right. I'm taking care of him. Okay, take your time. It's really not. I, honestly, I feel really privileged to be here with you. I'm, it's a, I get a sense it's an honor for you to show up with me. You're right. You know, normally I'm in the background, but I'm taking care of things. I'm not going to let anything slip. I'm watching the whole thing. I've got it all down. Yeah. And if he goes off rail anywhere, I'm there. I've got it all covered. Wow, that's amazing. How long you been doing that for? I've been doing it for. Almost the moment he was born. You get the picture? Yeah? Like, there's a very good reason why that part is active in the system and is dominating the psyche. And there's a very good reason often why this person in a position of power is dominating the structure. And, and there's, there's very often a long game needed, you know? And the long game in goes, involves going via the why and involves building genuine congruent relationship with these characters within the organizational system, you know, and over time having that conversation around where the areas of need are. Yeah, because this is the surest way, I think, that you will onboard somebody into this. So I think um, there, there, there are uh, very, very effective tactical maneuvers, and I'll give you two. I charge you for the third one tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, he's not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's my friend, I had to say. So, okay, so, in, you know, it's a discipline, it's a practice, it's a self-practice, it's a discipline. And so one is, um, and we had a conversation about some of this, so I'm, I, 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 th I think I'm talking to a little more specific. So one is, you have to be very, very careful to avoid the dominant discourse. In other words, they actually don't have power. The hierarchical leadership has inherent contradictions that will destroy itself. So this is something you have to know for sure and you have to understand that there's a lot of leverage points. When you enter the dominant discourse that they have power over me, they are limiting me, you are actually helping them build that edifice. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we do in my uh, foundations workshop plug plug is we look at the dominant discourse so i sat for example with the uh head of the uh nature conservancy and the first thing he said to me is oh did you hear i got a promotion i am now in charge of nine thousand people 
And I said, wow, I can't even get my chihuahuas to stop pissing on the floor. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> right? But we just, if you really look at it, that is what I call an irrealist position. No one is in charge of 9,000 people. So the first <laughs> discipline is you try to train, your, train yourself to not buy into the dominant discourse. And so this is a practice, this is something we're teaching. And there's, there are easy examples like that. And once you get going, it's a very powerful tactic. So that's, that's a kind of an external thing. The second thing is that um, you need to... Um, this is the harder one, this is more of an internal one, and that is you need to be able to um, understand where your actions are inside. Okay, so I'll give you an example because I don't want to make it too conceptual because I, I lose people, but so my theory on, I, I used to tell my friends who that phase where all your friends are getting married. And uh, you'd see a lot of your women friends that would get married and all of a sudden they had no more power. And what they turn into is not uh, sheepish, vi sheepish victims. They turn into naggers. So when you see someone who nags, it's because they are people who have bought into the fact that the other person has more power. That's what a nagger is. And they don't, uh, they, don't, they don't see that they're actually in the structure, right? So these two things, three things, underst if, you, if, you, if you do the work to understand the inherent contradictions, those people are running scared. That's helpful. Uh, work on uh, using uh, language outside of the dominant discourse. We call it a realist, not an irrealist position. And there's ways to, to, to do that. And the, th and the third thing is really check that you're not, your actions aren't being shaped by the assumption that this structure is in place. And those are really, those are three things, it's not easy, but they're very practical and they're very powerful tactical tools. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least, at least we're eating the, eating the organism from, you know, we're the worm that eats from this way because the, the edifice of power is also toppling down from other, other types of pressures. But I think there's a lot of tactical, tactical things you, you can do. In the spirit of two things, I would say that there's this, most of us have a view of how humans work, which is I believe something, so I do X. So I have a belief or a drive or a need for something, so that causes me to do something else. In actuality, what we do is I do something, and I make up reasons to make that seem logical and sane. And so that if you go to someone and say, hey, self-management, and they're a manager, they're just going to hear threats. They're just going to hear you have no value. You have nothing to add. We're going to do this without you. It's not a very productive start of a conversation. <laughs> Whereas if you go to them and say, hey, let's get agreement before we do something, or let's try this practice, and you start to talk about behaviors, and they go, that sounds like a great behavior. Let's do that together. And if you do enough of them over time, they'll start to have different beliefs. And so I think the biggest thing I would say is if you are trying to change an existing habitual structure, don't talk about beliefs or ideologies. Talk about specific practices mm -hmm. and why they're good and layer them up upon each other. And over time, I think it's possible you can transform an organization. Mm -hmm. This is hypothetical. I haven't done that. I've just started things for new. So my second, <laughs> thing, my second piece of advice <laughs> is quit. Just, just don't, don't work there. Work yeah. somewhere else. Choose to take yourself and your energies into a situation where you have more control. Yeah. Um, I like the idea of getting someone at the very top with all the power to say this is how we want it to be, that then you have a lot more mandate. But fighting against the system is hard. I think it's possible, and I salute anyone who is attempting to do that. If you find out ways to do it, share it um, widely, because that by far is the most common question I hear in this work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it's really good for you who are creating new worlds, that's great, but inside this organization, I want to change it, I want it to look more like this, and it's really tough. Mm. I think that, um, you know, I'm in the privileged position of um, spending my, making, earning my livelihood by helping leaders with this question. And I know Doug does the same thing, I know Bonnie does the same thing, James does the same thing. There's not very many of us in the world doing this work right now, and there's not very many leaders that We've we either we've identified or have 
who, who have made that inquiry public that are ready and willing to do that. So you talk about 0.0000001%. But I am confident that there are other leaders out there that are just waiting to be heard and waiting to be loved into their potential in, the, uh, in, this, new, in this new possibility. So yeah, thanks Kelly. Yeah. So maybe when you're done asking your question and your question's answered, you could go and take your seat. I'd like to just add one it thing. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. and leave it open for somebody else. Yeah. No, I think I just want to do a, like a actuality check here as well, because I mean, I've heard many stories recently. I mean, one's closely associated to you, you know, where people, I see people who are really passionate and invest a lot of energy and they get some kind of permission within the system. Uh, like, like this, there's this term, trim tab, I think it's really appropriate because we're on a boat. You know, you've got the, the main rudder that steers the boat and then you've got this trim tab for delicate maneuvering, right? And most big boats have them. And this term, trim tab, is a name a lot of people gave when instead of being a consultant or a coach or a change maker, you know, it's like, I'm a trim tab. And the, the metaphor fits because it's like there's this frigging great boat, you know, and you're trying to turn it very, gen like very gently but determinedly and you put in years of energy. And then somebody comes along who's got their hand on the big wheel and they just do that. <laughs> and the whole thing goes completely, not just back the other way, but even past it <laughs> in another direction. And, and that's just heartbreaking. And I think, I, I think it's probably inevitable in many cases, you know. And, and this brings me back to this question. It's like, what makes your heart sing? I'm frequently saying thank you so much. Anyone who feels that their heart is singing banging against closed doors for years and years, you know, and making small changes that spread in some way and maybe in time lead to some kind of lasting change on a, on a bigger scale. You know, but if you're not blissed out doing that kind of thing, you know, if that's not rocking your boat to stay with the metaphor, then you might want to think about doing something different. Yeah, and I believe that both yeah. are important. But, yeah, but I just want to challenge, I think, a certain attitude because because I have this attitude, you can be immensely curious about, you know, something that seems impossible. It actually seems impossible. You're never going to smash the hierarchy. It doesn't really work. And so for me, that makes it more interesting to me. And I'm not talking about bouncing my head because I don't experience it like mm -hmm. that. I, I experience it like, what is it about this? And where can we get in there? And mm -hmm. what are people about? And, you know, so I if you have that kind of attitude, then um, you may or may not fail, but it's not going to cost you, like, psychologically. And, and so um, I, I just want to also add that in the space, because there is a way to be really interested in this persistent structure of human condition without having it cost you whether you actually win or not, mm -hmm. because it's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add something to yeah. this? Mm -hmm. yeah. I actually don't have questions much rather than comments to this. Maybe I'll start with the presentation because I'm afraid it may take a bit of time. But it's uh, My name is Ashot. I'm working in a company which tries to make cities more livable. Um, in that way, it's an interesting description of what we do. But we make it uh, possible for people to park. It's an easy description of a service we provide, but it's much more to it than it is on the surface. Uh, I've been listening to the talk uh, with wide ears and even taking notes because there, there were a lot of interesting topics brought up uh, during the conversation. Um, at some point, actually within the last five minutes, I found that there is somewhat of a difference in how we talk about people who are in power. When you mention managers, you mention leaders. And to me, that sounds a, a slightly a different thing, although both are present in our world, or a, a, a vastly different thing, because managers sometimes are put on us by the organization, by the structure, and to which that actually is your block. So you have to jump over a wall, which is your manager. Um, sometimes it's also very interesting that um, I came from a different environment to Sweden, so I'm not originated from Sweden, but I've been in a very patriarchic, hierarchic, environment. Well, in Sweden, uh, many companies are actually quite flat. And that brings a big difference as to where you're jumping. Because I don't have to jump towards a specific floor or a person. The only limit I have is my fear of 
losing something, if I have something to lose, shame, if I have something to be shamed for or by somebody. Or my limits, my personal limits. And uh, that makes a slight diff a big difference in some people's lives. That's why sometimes I wonder, is that the reason why the Nordics are sometimes called the happiest countries? And um, with that, there were some talks also about um, values. And I found it interesting that you brought up several of those we follow in the company. And I'm not propagating, I'm not naming the company per se, because that's irrelevant here. And I'm going to bring you food for thought. But we found that there is an interesting uh, increase in happiness of the employees when we follow trust, collaboration, courage to change. Um, we also have this value, which is really interesting, is prestigious. And well, the manager uses prestige, this is like, I'm your boss, I'm managing 9,000 people. Me, as a, as a person who would have that responsibility, I would have, I had the instant reaction that I, I have to care for them. It's like, I, I'm responsible for them versus I am in charge of them. Indeed, I don't like to give orders versus I would like to be a part of the team. And I think that the difference between managers is, and leaders is that manager, leaders are actually chosen by the people. So you can't go around and say, I am the leader. No one would listen to you. It's your values create mm -hmm. that other people trust and trust you with their opinions, their beliefs. And then you work with them, not on top of them, not even for them. You're a part of the team. And when you were saying is that I, let's, let's work together on this instead of uh, let's do this. There was also an interesting talk I got, or a thought I got of a partly scamful meeting. I was at the event, I like to join very various events, and then at some point I understood, oh, it's another one of those. Let's get quick, rich quick schemes. But I suddenly understood one couple of points were really interesting, is that a person would not do much if they say, I want to be rich. Everyone wants to be rich, they just, I just want to be rich. But there is a difference when people say, I had enough of being poor. It's the same goal. The person's going to change something in their life. But once the person changes that I had enough of this structure, I had enough of this in my life, maybe I can change something. And it can work from bottom. I think it can work from top as well. <coughs> Within our organization, if you call it, um, we have a top-down approach and a bottom-up as well. But it does have to come from the top. The question is, can we as people, as 9,000 people, select, be able to change it in a way with a multitude being the majority, the top, that will be actually leaders, not our managers, that we won't be possibly slaves to them versus that we will be with them and we go for a common goal. And if there is no ceiling above us, maybe we can work to stuff we can only are limited by basically, I thought, our imagination. So. Somehow, during the conversation, all these topics are actually, I'm not sure if I actually missed anything, intertwined in this as maybe it's how we see the organizations and structures. As do we see them as managers? Uh, do we see the leaders among us? Mm -hmm. And can we follow those actual people instead of following whatever is imposed on us with the society? Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's food for thought or a conclusion I had, but I really wanted to share it and see maybe that something, someone can take it with them and change the way they perceive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shall Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like part of that for me is really just, just um, riffing on, I think what James was saying about, and from Bonnie, you know, what, what works and, and the incumbency that we have to notice leaders in our midst, acknowledge them, amplify them, give them our support, give them our love. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the ways that we can manifest that in mm -hmm. organizations. I'm curious about this topic. We talk a lot uh, in S3 around bottomarchy. <laughs> I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a word, you can check it out and see, you know, but like we talk about hierarchy, but what about bottomarchy? Because if I, if I kind of separate the cultural projection onto management um, from the function, you know, it's basically coordinating stuff and making decisions. Yeah? 
and we're learning these days that we can shift decision making to the group. You know, and that makes sense. It's like bring together relevant stakeholders to tap collective intelligence so you open up the kind of silo thinking and you can really diverge, you know, and, and draw in as much value as possible and then converge somewhere in some kind of experiment and learn as you go. So it's kind of applying agile mindset to how we do governance as well as how we do work. So if we, if we can shift decision making to the people, like the, the people impacted by decisions being the ones to make and evolve those decisions, um, then what we're left with is this business of coordination. And we see in Agile as well, it's like it, people can coordinate quite high level of complexity without any leaders. Yeah, we can visualize work, we can prioritize work, we can have boards of boards, and you know, so there's a lot of techniques that we can use to get around that as well. And but, that, but one of the things I see that's really essential for people to be effective at doing this isn't to have no leaders, but is more about every person in the organization recognizing themselves as a leader within their domain of accountability, no, their domain of autonomy to respond. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I, I see this potential, like we talk about decentralizing power, decentralizing organizations, um, that this idea that we're decentralizing leadership. And so if I, if I kind of bring that around to our current paradigm and I see, well, there's a lot of people in leadership positions, then the idea of the facilitative leader, I think, is quite an exciting one. You know, I would definitely be wanting to enable the facilitative leader to be there at the top of the system, you know, because their focus isn't on leading. Their focus is on facilitating the realization and the skill sets of everybody in the organization. So, to be so able can to I push this a little so. further? Is this interesting enough? So the notion of individual leader is part of the dominant discourse. There is no such thing. No one in the world stands up and makes people do things. There is no such thing as the individual leaders. Our 360s pretend there's a such a thing that the leader so, so Ralph Stacy uh, uh, has a lot of uh, really good um, writing on this. The leader has a mental model that we adopt, that I can say something and you receive it, like a bit of information, and it, it's an algorithm that you then do. But in fact, it's much more complex than that. It's, it's, it's non-linear. And that every, every time I say something to a group of people, if I'm a leader, then that gets interpreted in many ways, and then it gets restated, and then people do things, and then an, the outcome is actually something different than that. We don't even notice because we, the dominant discourse is there's something as an individual leader, and it doesn't exist because a leader is only it is in a complex relationship of human relating where people give their trust or buy into or alignment. There's some other thing happening. And so even, this is how insidious is. There is, that's, that's a mental construct that is not real. There, it's like people who think the, the queen ant is the leader. But when you really look at it, you have to project that into it, right? And so if you can, you, so... Um, there's many, so, and I don't want to go on, but this is exactly what, what we do with the, this, this constant discipline about the dominant discourse. So that, that, that doesn't exist. You have to make a mental model that there's a, some individual leader and your de-animated re relationship to that. So I saw you wanted to jump in, Joshua, but I just had one question, Bonnie, just a clarification. If we look at what I'm saying in another way, in terms yeah. of this idea of everybody realizing themselves as a leader. So I mean to mm. lead themselves. It's like to use their initiative and to act yeah. without the necessity to fall back on someone else's kind of guidance, uh, unless <coughs> it's expedient to do so. Is, yes. there another, is there another word that you would give to what we're referring to as leader in this way? Well, how would you describe yeah, that? Yeah, so I, I, was just, I was just making a forceful statement, because we're supposed to talk in headlines, I just realized. Um, in headlines? Yeah, oh, yeah, well, yeah. We're I never not so said good that. at that. Me and Bobby <laughs> are not good uh, at that. Somebody <laughs> sent it out to us in the emails. Yeah. I, I, I'm a rule follower, so I was just uh, trying to follow the rules here. Yeah, unlike these people, I, I'm a rule follower. So. Uh, um, yeah, so that, that, that 
looking at the concept of leadership as coming from the dominant discourse then creates conversations that are generative that, that we would then follow up on. Right? It's just the start. But that's one very, uh, that's a big one to examine. Yeah, and then you ask, well, what is a leader? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. My perspective would um, be do what works. Like it's, I think in some ecosystems and some communities, talking about leadership will be really productive. And the idea of everyone should lead some of the time and no one should lead all of the time, that could be a really healthy conversation which prompts uh, you know, things moving in the way you want. In other communities, it might not be healthy. It might be a big debate about what do you mean by leadership at all, and it might just be counterproductive. And I think that doing what works and using the language that works to create the change that you want would be the name of the game. Um, just to riff on everything that's been said here, I, I think that leadership can be so nonlinear and so non-concocted that it's actually invisible, even though you can feel it and sense it and it's mm -hmm. palpable. Um, Dr. Lori Kane is a poet and a writer and a PhD in organizational development. Um, and she was on a hot team at Microsoft and they had carte blanche to, to go through the company and, and, uh, and drop into business units and, and do work and make change. And she said that on her team, on any given day, they felt leadership. But they didn't know who the leader was on their exactly. team. Exactly. <laughs> it was completely invisible, but it was always present. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the question of management, the reason I love self-management is because it just merely recognizes the truth that we're all managers in our lives already. So if we know what to do at work and how to do it, we don't need bosses to tell us what to do. Thanks, Kale. Thanks, Ashok. So we'll leave room for two more people here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There's a mic here. They're going in the different direction. <laughs> Here comes one. Mm. Welcome. Hey. Welcome. How you doing? Burnt out punks, it says on this t-shirt. <laughs> awesome. So would you like to introduce yourself and offer your Definitely. They sing a song? Maybe, yeah. Uh, I'm CJ, and I don't know, nobody. Colleague of this guy. Um, and I'm very much into technology. Um, I read uh, Kevin Kelly's What Technology Wants, and the regarding the development of the technium and such. And I see us talking a lot about people and organizations. Um, where I am right now, uh, I feel a huge demand for, well, what happens to be my particular skill, which is kind of nice for me, not so nice for everyone that, that try to attract that demand and uh, sorry fill that that need um, and I feel what technology is doing is escalating the requirements of uh, competence and skill and increasing complexity I'm gonna read Bonnie's articles on, on complexity with much pleasure, I'm sure. But um, using these um, potentiating methods of organizations, are we going to be able to do it fast enough, or is the complexity of technology going to topple over us? What's your perspective? Should I comment on that? I, I, so, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of, I've written about this. So, um, yeah, so uh, um, 
So I tell a little story. And that is, it, way back when there was a big prize for someone to figure out how to predict what, how, how the star, how the planets moved relative to, relative to each other throughout the year in the sky. And it was actually a very complex equation that Ptolemy f won the prize for, right? It was very complex. And he had that because the stars would move this way and then they would move in the night sky sometimes that way. And he got it down so it could accurately predict the locations of all the planets in the night sky as, at every time of the year. So that's a very complex equation he solved, right? So the more people started learning about astronomy and stuff, it created more of this complexity. And then Coper we all know the rest of the story. Copernicus comes along and he says, why don't we just change the way we frame the problem? And now all of a sudden, the equation's less complex, but it still has more explanatory power. So it didn't reduce the situation, it released the complexity. So I say to managers, so I say, well, what does your company do? Do you, like Zappos, they don't sell shoes, they don't make shoes. I mean, what do they do? They, you know, they, they, they just process information. I said, so why is your company so complex? And I'll tell them this story. And I said, well, so did the planets all of a sudden race around and rearrange themselves so they went around the sun? And so, so the first question of complexity is you have to ask yourself, is the complexity in the world or is it in your way you're relating to the world? This is a very crucial question of our time. And the second piece, I've written a lot more, but headline piece is, in, in what is I see happening is that technology is fantastic, our dopamine systems are addicted to it, and there's a sense in which we're trying to frame our problems by chasing the kind of technology, we're chasing the kind of complexity that machines are good at handling. So uh, infinite uh, feedback loops and cybernetic systems. But we're not designing for the kinds of things that people are good at doing. So we have this false sense that we depend on machines to solve complexity problems. Because we're actually chasing the technological imperative. And so that's another big reframe. And so, you know, hopefully more of this is sussed out in my articles, but it's a really another one of these things that you need to get on the other side of the question to truly do radical transformation. You can't buy into these kind of things that seem to be one case, and maybe they're actually another case, but it's a very, very good question. My view is that technology gets baked in with the values of the society or the people that create it, and that if you look at you know, issues of our times and so on, if you look at like gender equality in the workforce, or if you look at global poverty and distribution of resources on a global scale, they're not problems of technology. And that we, we actually have the technology, we have the money, we have everything we need to fix those problems, physically, in terms of that kind of thing. And that what we really need is people to behave differently for those problems to resolve. So looking for the speed of technology to change things, or yes, it will change things, but it will have the values baked into it unless we really look at humans, society, and our relationships with each other. So I think that it's very much a case of a yes and when it comes to technology and the future of work. Yeah, so here's one of these prizes that someone should put out. Create technology that would reduce the complexity of people's lives. That is a radically generative challenge. That is what you should be working on. Please, I don't know how to do it. But that's the shift that we need in our collective imagination. What is technology for? To radically release the complexity of our modern lives, open up space so we can decide who do we want to be as a people. Don't chase the technology. Don't chase the machine. You're not going to win. Um, yeah, I think technology uh, will we'll adapt. We always have. Uh, for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, but chasing technology for the sake of technology is a non-starter. There's no fundamental demand for technology. There's no fundamental demand for computers. Every business in, in the world, uh, in history and in the future, is, is organized to serve one of eight human needs. There's food, clothing, shelter, communication, transportation, 
personal security, entertainment, and healthcare. That's it. Every business is organized to fulfill one of those human needs. And so to the degree technology helps us do that better, uh, there will be increasing technology. Um, a great case study is the Hire Group, based in Qingdao, China. And um, they are uh, all over the Internet of Things. And so they're the world's largest appliance maker. They have 70,000 employees. They broke them up into almost 4,000 self-managed work teams. And every one of these teams is a mini innovation platform. And they can go out and develop brand new products and services. And if they can sell them to willing buyers and create a product or service, they get to keep a big chunk of the profits. They keep enough profits and they're successful enough, they can spin that company off into its own company with outside investors. It's uh, an incredible uh, example of self-management adapting to, to the latest technology. And I'm aware I'm just going to repeat myself again, but as somebody who came very late to technology, yesterday someone asked a question in a, one of the speakers, who resisted smartphones? And I was one of four people who put my hand up, mainly because it just freaked me out. It, was, it just seemed too complicated for me, and it didn't bring value to my life. So I really, as me personally, I've gone to technology when it's brought value to my life. And until then, I've resisted it just because everybody else is doing it. So I don't watch TV, and I hardly watch any movies, and I had a brick for years. And you know that, that was my personal choice. And I, I don't know why I kind of got indoctrinated into that worldview, but it's... Uh, it was very much like need first and then response to that. And I think for me, so then repeating again this question, what works? It's like if technology is of benefit to what we want to achieve to make our lives simpler, I think it's another way of saying what you're saying, Bonnie, then, um, then great, let's use it for that. And if it's superfluous to the requirement, you know, then let it be because there's plenty of other things to be doing. And, and why I think this conversation tonight has been dominated more by the human element is because I think that's where the deficit is right now. I mean, technology kind of evolves by itself, yeah? It's like it's got its own kind of trajectory and movement. I don't know so much about that. I can't speak in what I would consider to be an informed way about it, but I just see it just keeps going somehow. And, and it's very distracting. It's very easy to get caught up in it and get addicted to those dopamine hits. But where we're not looking a lot of the time is, hey, what's happening here right now? What's important for us as human beings here right now? Look at the world right now. I mean, there's a shitload of things that we need to be addressing, you know, and there's a, there's a kind of sense of, for me at least, of some kind of urgency, you know, and a, and a consequence of inactivity in the immediate future. And so technology that can serve with that, great. But where's the growth curve? The growth curve is in how we relate with ourselves in more honest ways and how we relate with one another in more honest ways and how we learn to get over the hurdle of just basic decision making <laughs> so that we can build more healthy relationships, build trust, build communication and collaboration and deal with some of these issues that we're facing today. Mm, thank you. Matthias. Yeah, I'm going <coughs> to build a little bit on what CJ just brought up in terms of um, big themes of change, I guess, if you will. We've had you know, as he mentioned, technology and innovation kind of um, at an exceeding rate spreading across the world. But we also have two other polarities of, I believe, big themes of change. And um, one of them is that the world is becoming more and more distributed. And we see these in, I believe, in many different ways. For example, um, we have the internet, obviously, but where you can find your own subculture anywhere. So um, it's not just local geographically, it's local psychologically and socially. We also see movement towards decentralization. We, in Europe, we have the Brexit. Uh, we also have the Catalan, uh, you know, in Spain now, trying to get some independence. And we have some tension sometimes in the national structures. And another evidence of that is maybe, you know, giving away the power kind of also reducing in terms of people are in most democracies voting less and less. The participation in democratic elections are on a declining trend. Maybe because people don't believe that giving up their power is giving them the outcomes they want. And thus we have Brexit and things. The other big global trend 
that's also you know counter to the decentralization of governance and uh, influence is globalization, which is also very evident, right? We have global challenges that we brought up here. So the move towards reducing the distance psychologically, socially, in terms of communication. It's very evidently that that is actually happening. So these, to me, are two felt big themes of change, but they seem to be at the opposite spectra. So my question is, what do you believe is also out there in te terms of change, but also what is this going to mean for the future of organizations as we know them? What's going to have to change as these themes of change uh, develop in the future? Can you just repeat uh, the headlines of the... Yeah, so we have two ch themes of change, globalization and decentralization that's felt in different ways. What is, going, what, what, it's, what is that going to mean for um, organizations in the future, do you believe? I think that one of the most interesting ways, when we talk about technology, we often look at what does the technology do? Self-driving cars, what will that do, car, you know, and so on. And what can I use those things to do and whatnot. But I think the, a really interesting lens is how will that change me and how will that change us? The, you know, when we got the technology of writing, it changed the way people remembered things, and we stopped remembering things in the same way. When we got the technology of cell phones, who remembers phone numbers anymore? And you know, it changed us a little bit. If cars drive us around, what will that change in our sense of navigation, in our sense of place in the world? So asking the question of technology of how will that change us at an individual level and a collective level, I think is one way of saying, because the way we are shaped is how we're going to shape the organizations that we're part of. And I think that there's so many different potentials there, but one of them with the globalization is that if you look at economies, such as a tourist economy, where you, you go and you have a transaction with one person and you never see that person again, as opposed to you have a village economy, where you have a transaction with one person and you have the same one again the next day and the next day and the next day, different strategies become optimal. It's much more likely to be ripped off in a once-off economy than it is to be ripped off in a repeat economy. And so I think that the potential for technology to bring all of us together, where it's really easy for you to look at every past transaction this person has done with other people, starts to mean it will change the way, change our strategy. So it's not a good strategy to rip people off because it's really easy for other people to find that out. And the potential for technology and bringing us closer to build a more honest society, a more ethical society, where behaving in the right way is actually the smartest strategy, are really enticing potentials and that reinforcing those technical trends are quite helpful. Likewise, I'd also add that the technology of seeing the effects that I can't normally see, seeing that the way I live my life has effects on people on the other side of the world, and they might look really different for me and have very different um, situations, but I can feel empathy for their situation and draw a link between the things that I purchase or the way that I live affecting an island sinking in the Pacific or people losing their homes or mass migration might make it more likely for me to change my behavior and make different choices. So the, in the ways technology can make us more ethical and the, way to, the ways that technology can make us more, have more empathy for people, I think they're deeply promising trends that give me hope. And the final one would be having access to the world's information really easily means that we can get better at things quite quickly. And it's just that that is actually a miraculous thing that we're building that can be a great tool. So often there's, and there is as, as many dystopic stories of a future technology and the impact it will have on us as there are hopeful ones. And the one, the, I would come back to that main offering is what works, what serves us? Which stories will give us the world that we want and which stories won't? I think the topic of individualism and collectivism coming at the end of our conversation is, is like there's so many tangents that that I can see we could go off on. And, and to summarize it, I think what we need to do is create a very conscious and intentional balance between the two. You know, so globalization that leads us to collectivism and the elimination of human freedom yeah, is, a, is a horrible trajectory to go on. And we've seen many examples of that historically in the world before. And at the same time, radical individualism at some point will justify emergence of the same. And it's how do we if we come back to organizations on the local level, how do we grow organizations where individuals have a sense of autonomy 
of meaning, of fulfillment, where, they, where we as individuals can thrive and grow and express our potential and our, our bliss and do that in a way that's constructive and of benefit to others. And at the same time, when that activity impacts on another in a way that causes some kind of harm, you know, or limitation of their capacity to do the same, that we have the conversation at that interface. You know, and, and, and I don't think that's an easy thing to do. And I don't think it's something that we can kind of attain and then sustain without ongoing maintenance over generations. You know? And it will be, in some contexts, easier for people and in some cultural circumstances easier for people than others. But it's a global question. It's something that we need to all be considering. You know? Because the consequences of polarizing into one direction or the other historically, and I imagine for all time, will always be quite horrid. You know, and we, we have never been at a point before where we can understand the implications of that in such a profound and global way. And perhaps not at a point before where we have the capacity to address that in a global way. And I think that whatever we discover and learn together and, and ultimately choose on that topic will determine our future in terms of freedom or uh, on the other side, whatever you can imagine the other side of freedom to be. Um, Rod Collins uh, wrote the book Wiki Management. He's a futurist, um, getting ready to write another book about um, the technology of the future. And he actually believes that uh, decentralization technology like blockchain has the potential to reduce evil in the world because it will be increasingly difficult to engage with the world globally or locally unless you become a person of high trust and high reputation. Uh, so in 19, I think, 89, um, the architect Christopher Alexander, who invented the notion of pattern language, um, spoke at Uppsala, which I think is here in Stockholm. And it was early on. Close. Uh, <coughs> well, it's close somewhere, right? <laughs> Not to people in Stockholm, anyway. No. <laughs> well, is it in Stockholm? It's in Sweden. Just oh, it's in Sweden. <laughs> yeah, okay. just up a bit. Sorry, close, close, but no cigar. Anyways, it's kind of interesting that it comes full circle because it was early in the uh, 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 software revo re revolution and he, in a very humble way, said that, you know, he didn't know a lot about software, but that he had the impression that there was a choice, that the, the people, that the coders, the digital, the digerati, were going to make a very important choice for most of us. And that is, he saw that, and this is where I'm ho actually hopeful about technology, because he saw that um, by default, this kind of technology creates, uh, can create global control, right? So who owns the platform and, and, and stuff like that. But he also saw that within a, with a certain view, it could create the conditions for uh, networked local control. And so he talks, he talks, talks about, uh, so now, so in my work, we have this concept of federated autonomous zones. So organizations, to bring it back, are actually semi-autonomous entities that can single-handedly um, control these eight needs. And then they network for more icing on the cake. But that, that um, so this creates a very anti-fragile society and it forces people to have local commons. But I don't think we can, so I think technology has now given us the ability to do that and yet open up global access for information and all this other stuff. So I see this as the best of both possible worlds to say what uh, access should be global in the Free and the small enterprise of organization should be local. And I think technology gives us uh, the potential to realize this for the, f for the first time. Mm. So that's where I actually feel hopeful. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, CJ. Thanks, Matthias. Um, we are coming to the end of our time this evening. It's gone really, really fast. Um, just I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful audience we've <coughs> had this evening. And I'd like to invite the noble minds to see if they can um, check out with a reflection on how it's felt to be a noble mind, <laughs> how it feels to be a noble mind, and what you would like um, our delightful audience in person and on the live stream to leave with this evening.
Whoever's feeling moved to speak first, please. So I'll go first because I went last. So I, um, I don't know. I'm more confused than ever. And, um, um, but it's been a lov lovely evening. So I guess uh, that's what it feels to be a noble mind, confused, integrated with a lovely, lovely evening, lovely experience. So thank you all for participating and very much appreciate it. I want to thank uh, my friend Susan Basterfield for her excellent facilitation tonight. And thank all of you for hanging with us for two full hours. It seems like it went really fast. And um, I guess just my final thought is um, we don't know what the future holds. So let's embrace the unknowingness of it, embrace the anxiety, and uh, enjoy the ride as best we can. Okay, well, I'm glad that I inserted my humble mind when I was coming tonight, and I, I feel it's such a relief, you know, to surrender into not knowing and to surrender to that open space. And I've learned a lot tonight, sharing with you, and, and also hearing you folks that came up and inputted into here as well. Um, and I don't know if confusion is what's around for me. It's like it's more just a sense of, ah, okay, well, this is how it is. For now, hmm. and I'm I'm perpetually hopeful. You know, I, I even if we face our like most horrific demise, I'm still perpetually hopeful. Maybe it's that thing of how you know it's a choice how we go to the gallows. <laughs> yeah, but I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but I imagine. That's spoken from a perpetually hopeful person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's yeah? beautiful. Okay, b but I yeah. imagine I imagine this: the whatever happens next beyond the kind of epic tragedy of comets hitting Earth or something, yeah, whatever happens <laughs> next will be the consequence of our shared actions and inactions. Now, I am absolutely sure this will be so. And so I feel at peace with that, you know, and at peace knowing that in each day I can just wake up and do my best to be the change I want to see. And, and uh, it's such a privilege to be with all of you. And, and I suspect were we to sh open this conversation up, we would discover we are in a room full of noble and humble minds. So thank you so much for bringing your energy and resonance into this space. What's coming up for me is the idea that I think most of us are conditioned to spend a lot of energy trying to be right or accurate or correct. And that I think it's much the, the idea of here, you know, what's true and seeking for truth. But I think it's just better to be more useful. And that instead of focusing on, is this the right way or is this, you know, how the world works, it's just like, is this a useful position? Is this a useful belief? Is this a useful habit? And that looking for that, you know, what works for you and what works in a context and what works for other people and copying that and sharing that, for me, that just feels like an inherently uh, better way of being. So I appreciate the, that context of the conversation and, um, yeah, utmost respect, utmost respect for the thinking. Uh, that folks have had, and it's a privilege mm -hmm. to spend time with you. So one more word to the audience. Um, I'd like to invite you to reflect back on your reflection from the beginning of the session, what's most alive for you, what's enlivening you, and invite you to take that into the foyer and maybe have that conversation with somebody you don't know or somebody that you do know over a drink. I'd like to acknowledge Matthias and Mikhail for having this dream and just what a delight it's been to be with you tonight. Thanks very much. And thank, and thank you, Susan, and uh, everybody else who's enjoyed uh, themselves, I hope, uh, with us here tonight. And with that, uh, the first ever Noble Minds about the future work is concluded. So what is going to happen now is um, there is time for a little bit of a mingle up in the bar. And uh, yeah, what's going to happen there, Mikael? Yeah, we have more uh, free <laughs> rings. <laughs> 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 so uh, say hello to me or Ellie. Over there, yeah, you saw her before. And uh, I do, uh, we're trying to um, implement uh, open participatory organization within 4Cafe. And it's not that easy. 
Um, so if anyone would like to help me how to do budgeting without budget, um, come to me and try to help me out here. Because Ellie would like to have a budget in Starcom and I said, no, just buy the shit you want, <laughs> you need. So is that enough? I don't know. And with that inquiry, I invite you to the bar. Thank you Thank very you. much for tonight.